Hello, my name is Matthew Cheeseman. I lecture in Creative Writing at University of Derby and I've been involved in Write First for three years. When Kay and I were developing this session, we wanted to introduce creative writing to researchers working in other disciplines. We wanted to teach techniques and discuss writing in general. And so the title of this session, Writing Without Discipline, means you can come at writing from any discipline. And it's also a pun, of course, because writing requires a lot of discipline, no matter where you, where you work from. So to begin with, I'd like to look at a paper which looks at writing in the university. It's entitled, What Can Academic Writers Learn From Creative Writers? And it describes some of the ways researchers tend to view themselves as rational, intellectual, logical, controlled, clean, technical. The academic is someone who doesn't make mistakes. The academic is someone who produces and writes like a machine. And the authors go on to discuss writing in opposition to this. Writing as an emotional act, as something which is physical, bodily, unruly, vulnerable, creative. Basically all the things that researchers don't tend to frame themselves as. And this might explain why researchers often find writing difficult. Of course, creativity is the property of all writing. We can have creative non-fiction, creative report writing, creative research papers. When we speak of creative writing, we often mean imaginative writing. Novels and poems often imagine situations that don't exist. So in this session, you're going to practice creative techniques that you can use in imaginative and non-imaginative contexts. Pause me so that you can meet each other, and when you've finished introductions, you'll need something to write with, pen and paper or a laptop. You should all have an image in front of you. So, on a piece of paper or on your laptop, I'd like you to write down four things about the picture that can be confirmed simply by looking. Four facts. For example, here's my image. For my four facts, I choose it's a drawing of a person reading a book in the sun. The person appears to be naked. They are sitting on a chair. And once you've got those four facts, write down one thing that you totally invent. And for my invention, I think that the person is reading a letter from a long lost lover. Have a go yourself, four facts, one invention, and then the facilitator will take over the rest of the exercise. You should now have 10 observations and 10 imaginations. So by two acts of close attention, with your eyes and the workings of your own imagination, you've got all you need now to write a story. Notice how creative writing is grounded in a combination of observation and invention. In this way, it tells us something of the world and what the world could be. This is why writers carry notebooks around with them. Not only are they writing down imaginative ideas that come to them, but they're also seeing things in the world which they think they can use in their work and writing down observations. Some researchers have used creative writing to talk about research questions. Paul Graham Raven, for example, is both a science fiction author and an engineer, and he's used science fiction to comment about energy futures. So now that we've played around with the potential of creative writing, let's focus more about what writing is. So to do this, I'm going to lean on a book about the writing process by Mike Sharples called How We Write. Sharpel says that children learn to tell stories as an extension of speaking. The model all children learn first is, and then this happened, then this nap happened, now this thing happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, the end. This is something that we can all still do ourselves now. Uh, and here's an example that I wrote pretty much without thinking about the image. My dear, I hope you are well. I know that you were very sick and I hope that you are still looking after yourself. I hope you have a new doctor. I did not like your doctor. He locked you in a room and subjected you to awful therapies. I hope you're in a better place now. I'm fine, still traveling, 
still safe. I'm sorry that what happened between us was so traumatic. The shock stays with me every day, even though it is so long ago. Up until the age of 10, this is the only storytelling strategy children follow. Da 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 da, then this happened, then this, then this. You just make it up and you see where you go without worrying about the end. So this strategy, which Sharples calls knowledge telling, is still the way we form text in our minds and we can use it to help us write. Free writing is the name of a technique used by creative writers that harnesses this knowledge telling strategy and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And you can free write about anything. It's a really useful way of generating text which you can edit later. So we're gonna try some free writing now and you're all gonna write without stopping for a couple of minutes. And it's fine to make mistakes during this. So, so I'd like you to get ready to write. It doesn't matter, you can type or you can, you can write it out with a pen or pencil. But there are rules to free writing which I'd like you to follow. Firstly, when the timer starts, you must write until it stops. Even if you can't think of anything to write, just write, I can't think of anything to write. Just keep going. So secondly, write whatever comes into your head. Thirdly, you don't need to make sense or write in complete sentences. The important thing is you don't pause. You write for the whole two minutes. And remember, no one is going to check your work. So I'm going to give you something to write about, a prompt. I'm going to ask you to write about your image. So you can write about the observations you made. You can write about the inventions you made. You can write about a combination of both of them. It really doesn't matter. Just make sure you use your image as a starting point and then see where you go. So if you need some words to start with, you can use this image reminds me of. But if you want to start somewhere else, prompted by your image, do so. Okay, I'm going to hand over to the facilitator to, to time your exercise. Whatever your experience is with free writing in this instance, it's a really useful way of generating text and can really help you produce work to edit later. And hopefully you can see how it draws out what's already there in the head, taps into what's running around in our conscious mind and perhaps our unconsciousness too. But that doesn't necessarily make free writing creative. Indeed, there is no special method of being creative which is applicable to writing alone. There are rather general theories of creativity that are applicable in, in other contexts. And many of these theories of creativity, they emphasize the importance of daydreaming, forming analogies and metaphors, mapping concepts, and finding key ideas, ideas that orientate our, um, our, our writing. See Sharple's book for more discussion of this. So depending on your focus, you can use free writing to do different things. For example, free writing at an intense pace gives a cerebral, controlled result, very descriptive. I find it useful to locate key ideas in whatever it is I'm writing about. While writing at a slower, more rhythmic way allows you to be more creative or imaginative. It's easier to form analogies, create metaphors, jump around. So, for example, free writing at, in, at an intense pace, um, I, I, I'll give it a go. The man is sitting on the chair in the sun. It's beating down on him. He is reading. What is he reading? Text on the paper. That's what I'm interested in. What could the text be? A letter? Who from? Someone he worked with, a lover? When? Prison? Maybe, maybe something to do with a prison. Like he is in now, a room 
which is a prison. Okay. Now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to be less kind of focused. And for me, I have to, I have to relax a little and, and write at less of a, of a pace. And it allows me to, to kind of escape from the text, but find metaphors within it. The man in the sun, the light, the warmth, the beach, lying in an inside beach, the outside world brought in, the feel of the wood, the birds in the sky, the grain of the sand, the pebbles, the pebbles, the rocks in his head. So just by moving my mind into a different place, I kind of went different areas. And why don't you pause me now and try the second method, the slower method, um, where you go more places with your images for a couple of minutes. And once you get the rhythm right, just go with where your words take you. You don't need to say it out aloud like I did. So we become more proficient at writing as we grow up. And one of the reasons is that we learn how to manage this knowledge telling strategy, this flow of words that we can all turn on. We learn how to manage it using a range of technology and techniques, some of which we learn at school. Writing is the most important technology of all, of, all, of course. That allows us to record our words, to freeze them in time. Other technologies and techniques help us manage complicated writing projects and help us shape our knowledge telling abilities. All of these affect our writing in different ways. So paper and pen allows us to make notes quickly. Post-it notes allow us to rearrange ideas. Typewriters are really good for writing something and getting to the end of it without too many changes. Word processors do the opposite. And just as laptops let you write in libraries and coffee shops, uh, desktops are, are good for having your own quiet space, your own office. Programs here like Write or Die, Scrivener or Ulysses, they help you organise big projects and texts. Um, and websites such as 750 Words encourage us to write something every day. There are two things that definitely help writers. The first is a community of support. And this could be a writer's group where you read and discuss each other's work. As researchers, I recommend you do this regularly. It doesn't matter if you're not specialists in each other's fields. Get together, give honest and constructive feedback and critique. And it doesn't matter whether you're writing a novel or a thesis. Share your writing and take on board other people's comments. Use the group as something to motivate you in delivering drafts. The second thing is related to that last point. Develop a writing habit. Write every working day, no matter what. Write for 30 minutes or an hour in the early morning or at night, whenever. If you have the time, edit what you wrote yesterday before you start again. And if you're one of those people who thinks, well, I need more than an hour to get into it, then you'll, you'll need to learn how to write for an hour a day instead. And it might take you a few weeks before you're used to this. But believe me, you can learn how to do it. It's, a, it's, it's something we learn, it's a skill we learn to do. So if you're one of those people, perhaps consider learning how to write in short periods of time at a go. Um, if you don't believe you can do it, try it for a week. Developing a writing habit allows you to write without worry. It forgives the bad days when nothing happens and gives you the good days. And because you're going to write every day, it doesn't matter what happens, it's something you do. I need help motivating myself to do this, so I use a, web I use a website, 750 words, and every day I write 750 words. I'm sure other websites are available. 
So do pause me now to discuss the technology, the techniques, the habits that you use. What could you change or develop? Could you start a writing group? So we've discussed writing, knowledge telling, and we've done some exercises on free writing. We've discussed technology and techniques. And now we're going to discuss a third thing, which is reflection, a crucial part of the writing process. It's when you stop producing text and you think about the text that you've already produced. And when children learn to write, they begin to reflect between the ages of 10 and 14. Before that, they just, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. But then they begin to see writing as a thing that can be planned, changed, and edited, not just the knowledge-telling action of writing itself. So reflection allows us to alternate between writing and thinking. And we can do a number of things when we reflect. We can read through our work. We can think about ideas, associations, or memories that our work brings up. We can form and transform ideas. We can specify what new material to create, where you're going to take the piece. And we can work on the organisation of what you've written. So for the next exercise, I want you to read through what you've written and reflect on it. Try to follow some of the processes outlined on the slide. You might circle things out, circle things that interest you, or cross things out. There's no right or wrong way of reflecting. Just give it a go. So although everyone produces text in the same way, the knowledge-telling strategy, not everyone reflects in the same way. And Sharples believes that how you write is determined by when you start reflection in the writing process. And the essential difference is between those who begin with a period of reflection, a planner, and those who begin with a session of knowledge telling or a session of engaged writing, sort of writing to think. So we've got planners and those who write to think, and perhaps we could have a show of hands in the room right now of those who are planners. Put your hands up if you plan something before you write. And then those who just start, they write to think. Aside from this very basic division, there are many different sorts of writers. There are those that write in one pass, from beginning to end, with few pauses or revisions. There are those who plan the thing, write the thing, and then revise the thing in that order. And then there are those who revise as they go, sentence by sentence, polishing gradually from the beginning to the end. These people may begin with a plan. And there are those who produce rough plans, which they may diverge from when they start writing. They may start writing a piece of work in the middle or at the end. And there are also those that start by writing and then produce new ideas as they write, revising the text many, many times. So the important thing to remember is that none of these patterns are natural and unchangeable. All of them are learnt behaviours. I used to be one of those writers who had to revise as I went, sentence by sentence, polishing gradually from the beginning to the end. But a couple of years ago I changed how I write and reflect, and now I start by planning the text, writing it, and then revising it. It's improved my writing, and it's definitely improved my work rate, as I'm not wasting time polishing text I'll never keep. So in groups of three or four, could you discuss which of these patterns matches your approach to writing? Would you think about changing it? So think about the first structures you encountered. Stories, thank you letters, essays, texts. The more we practice these, the more we think about them, the more we read them, the better we get at writing them. So as we grow older, we read more and more different things, and by reading we learn about them. We begin to recognise aspects of them. We understand the style of the writing, the content of the writing, the language and the syntax, the organisation and purpose of texts, and we understand how each of them organises the expectations of readers. 
I like this quote from Sharples, which describes the importance of this well. To become a skilled writer in whatever area, fiction, journalism, technical documentation, requires more than maturity of thought and a command of language. The writer must be able to summon up mental schemas to frame and propel the activity. Just as expert musicians can play scales, chords and melodies from memory, as an architect knows standard forms and the properties of materials, and as a chess player can recognise and respond to over 20,000 chess positions, so a skilled writer gains a tacit knowledge of language, style and structure. So, the more you expose yourself to a text or style, the better you become at it. Be that fan fiction, poetry, tweets, blogs, lesson planning, writing research papers or novels. So following that logic, if you're writing a thesis, how many theses have you read? And if you haven't read any, can you ask your supervisor or someone to recommend some theses so that you can absorb the style and structure of their presentation? So to recap, following Mike Sharples, writing is four things. Firstly, it's our ability to generate a flow of words from improvisation and association, from what we already know somewhere. This is what I've been referring to as knowledge telling. Secondly, it's the ability to record and develop our thoughts using a variety of technologies and techniques. Thirdly, it's the process of reflection and revision which allows us to transform our writing. And fourthly, it's a growing awareness of language, style and structures that we can, with lots and lots of practice, learn or even master. The important point is that none of this is beyond our skills. It just takes a little bit of time, preparation and a willingness to experiment. Remember these four principles whether you're writing a poem, novel, thesis or research paper. 1. Be disciplined and consistent with writing. Write every working day for 30 minutes or an hour. 2. Experiment with technologies and techniques. Most importantly, join a writing group. 3. Reflect, revise and edit so that you transform your writing. 4. Keep reading and practicing so that you develop your awareness of language, style and structure. As a final note, if you're writing every day, if you're producing words, remember that it's fine to also get rid of what you, you produce. It's fine to delete things. It's fine to decide that what you've been trying hasn't worked out. Don't feel that you have to always make something of what you produce. And on that note, I'd like to, um, uh, to thank you for listening um, and I hope that you've got something uh, from today.